Hi, I'm John Ainsley from Doulos. I was co-author of the System C standard and also an author of the TLM2.0 documentation. I'm going to talk to you about TLM2 interoperability. Let's start by defining some terms. In TLM2, an initiator is a component that initiates new transactions. A target is a component that acts as the endpoint for a transaction. And an interconnect is a component that simply forwards transactions and is neither an initiator nor a target. Transactions themselves are passed by reference in TLM2. They can be passed in the direction from initiator to target or on the forward path, or also passed back from target toward initiator on the backward path. At the heart of TLM2 are six interface method calls that form the TLM2 core interfaces. On the forward path, there are calls to B transport, NB transport, get direct memory pointer and transport debug. And on the backward path, calls to NB transport backward and invalidate direct memory pointer. Let's investigate those core interfaces in a little bit more detail because they're the first step toward achieving interoperability in TLM2. First, blocking transport. The B transport method is the most straightforward way to pass a memory map bus transaction, the complete transaction com executes in just a single function call. B transport is only called on the forward path, and as well as passing a transaction by reference, it also includes a timing annotation argument. And B transport is used with the loosely timed coding style, where the goal is to maximise simulation speed. The non-blocking transport interface is a little more complicated. It supports calls on both the forward path and the backward path. And the idea with non-blocking transport is to support multiple phases, where a single transaction involves multiple calls to NB transport, some called in the forward direction, some called in the backward direction. And that allows more phase transitions and more timing resolution, and at the same time sacrifices some simulation speed. So it's typically used with the approximately timed coding style. And the final method calls belong to the DMI and the debug interfaces. DMI interface is the direct memory interface. The get direct memory pointer method, which is called on the forward path, requests a direct memory pointer from a target. The invalidate direct memory pointer, which is called on the backward path, um, invalidates the uh, DMI region that's previously been accessed and granted. Finally, transport debug is used for non-intrusive read and write operations. So transport debug is only called on the forward path, and the whole point of transport debug is that it executes with zero delay, no context switches, no side effects. For each of these interfaces, a single transaction type is passed, and the transaction type that gives maximum interoperability is the generic payload. The generic payload has been designed specifically for modelling memory map buses, so it features a command, address, data, byte enables, a streaming mode, and a response status. And the generic payload can be used in one of two ways. It can either be used off the shelf for, for creating very abstract models of memory map buses where you're not concerned about the details of specific protocols or it can be extended and used to describe the behavior of a specific protocol by making use of the extension mechanism so the generic payload extension mechanism is one of the key bits of machinery in tlm2 it has a number of advantages generic payload extensions can be routed through components then that know nothing about them so in the example shown here, the initiator and the target at the top can both understand an extension that's routed through a base protocol router that knows nothing about that extension. The same mechanism can also be used to create private extensions, where the generic payload is just used as a place to temporarily put attributes that are best associated with the transaction. And other components don't need to know anything about those private extensions. So let's step back from the detail now and have a look at interoperability more generally in TLM2. The interoperability layer consists of the core TLM2 interfaces, the APIs, that are necessary to give the maximum level of interoperability. 
So it consists of the interfaces we've discussed, the initiator and target sockets, the generic payload, and the base protocol. And the base protocol is a collection of rules for putting together these other elements for maximum interoperability. In addition to the interoperability layer, TLM2 also defines a couple of coding styles, loosely timed and approximately timed, and a set of utilities. The coding styles and the utilities don't directly make or break interoperability, but they are important for productivity, they're important to ensure a consistent coding style and to minimise the learning curve for TLM2. So amongst the utilities, there are convenience sockets, the quantum keeper, which is used with the loosely timed coding style, and payload event queues that are used with the approximately timed coding style. We've seen that amongst the core interfaces, there are both blocking and non-blocking transport methods, and that the blocking transport method is typically used with the loosely timed coding style. So let's look at a scenario where a loosely timed initiator is communicating with a loosely timed target. So that's straightforward because all components call be transport. Now let's introduce into the picture an approximately timed initiator that's making calls to NB transport. Now clearly something special has to happen here um, in order to maintain interoperability. Well the trick lies with the utilities. There is a particular convenience socket, the TLM target socket, that supports automatic adaption between the blocking and the non-blocking interfaces. So the non-blocking calls from the initiator get intercepted by the simple target socket, and the simple target socket then does the appropriate adaption to call the B-transport method in the target. Of course, although the blocking and the non-blocking methods can be combined without compromising interoperability, in order to maximise simulation speed, models should still be matched for performance. So even a single approximately timed component introduced into a loosely timed simulation might significantly impact the performance of that simulation. So TLM2 supports interoperability at two different levels. For maximum interoperability, you'd make straight use of the interoperability layer. Remember, the interoperability layer consists of the base protocol combined with the generic payload used through the standard sockets. So any initiators, interconnects and targets that make use of the base protocol can be connected together off the shelf and will talk to each other. However, it's still possible for functional incompatibilities to exist, even using the base protocol. For example, a target might not support certain features of the generic payload, for example, byte enables or streaming width. Such a target would still be compliant with the TLM2 standard and could be connected to other such components, but may give functional errors if it's incompatible in that sense. The other kind of interoperability that TLM2 supports is when defining new specific protocols. So a new protocol cannot be bound to the base protocol. Or more specifically, if you have two sockets that are templated to use different protocol types, then they can't be bound together. However, new specialised protocols should still be created on top of the generic protocol, and that's got two particular advantages. Firstly, the specific protocol can still exploit the consistency of coding style that the base protocol and the generic payload support. And secondly, the new protocol can still exploit the extension mechanism of the base protocol and the generic payload. So in this case, we've got an adapter inserted between two different protocols, and that adapter can do an extremely low-cost conversion between the two different protocols because they're based, both based on the same underlying TLM2 machinery. So, if this has been useful and you want to find out more information on TLM2, well, I represent Dulos, we're a training company. We can offer you training classes in TLM2, System C, or in System Verilog, Verilog, VHDL, or a range of other EDA language standards. If you want more information, have a look at our website, www.dulos.com. There you'll find lots of interesting resources, including some free TLM2 tutorials and the TLM2 protocol checker.